And today, we're talking about this, the good book. Right? We're talking about the Bible today and what the Bible means to us and what, uh, how important it is and what we can learn from it and how we should learn from it. So here's my question. We're not going to break into groups. I just want you to, by a show of hands, thumbs up, thumbs down, uh, however you want to do it, is who has read or listened to Scripture in the past week on purpose? Right? Not like you just listened to Caleb and they read some scripture that passed by you, right? Okay. Very good. Okay. How many people, uh, so this includes the people who all raised their hand, or they just heard scripture in passing. They read it on like a sign as they're like walking through Hobby Lobby. How many people saw scripture this week of any sort? Read it. So the people who raised their hand already? Okay. The Bible, depending on where you shop, is everywhere. You can find Bible verses on the bottom of uh, fast food cups. Right? Uh, I don't think we have any around here. Is that in and out? But they have Bible verses on the inside. Uh, different companies hide Bible verses inside their clothing tags or inside the lining of clothes. And that's great. But we're going to look at the Bible as a whole. And what is the Bible? Well, let's start with the manual, what we believe as a Nazarene church. And it is, we believe in the plenary inspiration of the Holy Scriptures by which we understand the 66 books of the Old and New Testaments given by divine inspiration, inherently revealing the will of God concerning us and all things necessary to our salvation, so that whatever is not contained therein is not to be enjoined as an article of faith. Very churchy and legalese if you will. Basically it's saying there are 66, 66 books in the Bible and it can't be wrong about what we need for salvation. Right? That's basically what this is saying in a lot less words, I think. Um, and so I was looking, uh, you know, as any good millennial does, I googled what is the Bible <laughs> to see what other people are talking about it. And um, this article written by Janet uh, Kismar, Chismar, she says, for one thing, the Bible is a collection of books written by dozens of authors over many hundreds of years. Some are very brief, less than a page, while others are much longer. But in spite of their diversity, when you examine them, you discover that they all have a common theme, God's relationship with the human race. So, this is one big book. I have a large print Bible. That's probably why mine looks a little bit uh, bigger than some of yours. I used to have the little, the really little ones, but when I'm up here reading and feeling the pressure, it's hard to read, like all the, the just looks like the, the cartoon blocks of writing. So I got the large print. So it looks really big. I have a study Bible at home that's bigger. We have a family Bible that's even bigger. But really all it is is a collection of books inside of one big book that people have put together over time and through councils and said these are all the important books of God's story. So I think, to me, that makes me feel better that I don't have to say, I have to read the whole Bible. Right? Like, I gotta read this whole thing when there's really just 66 separate books. All right? So they're made up of not just the books kind of like we know them as like uh, chapter books and novels, but there are letters, there's history inside of here, there are poems, there are just stories, there are prophecies, there are laws, there are gospels, which is the story of Jesus, and there's even like advice columns. Right? So Proverbs was the original Dear Abbey, but much smarter than Dear Abbey. Right? So there's a lot of stuff contained in the cover of one of these bottles. And like I said, it makes, it's less intimidating to me. It, you know, like, I don't have to say, I have to read from Genesis 1 to Revelation and to, to like, get the whole, I have to do it all at one time, one chapter. Right? And, Say, I'm going to read all the letters today. Maybe not one day, but I'll read all the letters for this season of my life. And so, here's another thing I Googled. It is, what does the Bible say about the Bible? It doesn't say very much. Because this didn't exist. This Bible did not exist when, when Jesus was preaching. They had some uh, the Old Testament stuff, which is the Pentateuch, or what the Jewish people would read from, the first few books of the Bible. But we can find something in one of the letters, the epistles, that Paul writes to Timothy. And so this is near the end of the, the Bible, right before uh, Hebrews, 
And I'm going to have it up here. You can follow along with me. And, uh, or you can just listen. <coughs> this is 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 through 17. So this is Paul writing to Timothy. While evildoers and impostors will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those who you learned it. And how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. All scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. So that the servant of God, as the people who follow God and believe in Jesus, in our context, may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So, that's an important verse about what the scriptures are, according to the scriptures. So, here's, here's the first question I want to ask is, what are some reasons we don't read the Bible, or we, people don't read the Bible? What are some uh, I say reasons, you can count it as excuses, I guess. What are some excuses people give for not reading the Bible? That are a part of the church. People who go to church are believing in God. What are some of the reasons they don't? Yeah. Uh, so lack of priority for the Bible? Lack of time. Time. They don't understand it. I would think too in some cases they might have the wrong translation for them. That's a good one because I use when I got the ESV Bible, not in my notes, but just kind of, uh, I tried to read all the other different translations, a lot of different translations out of them. And I got I ordered myself an ESV Bible and for whatever reason it's, it's like a difficult Bible for some people to understand, but for me it just clicked. But like some people the King James Version is like that's it. It's so beautiful and poetic. It makes sense. For me, the ESV Bible was, like, spoke to me. So, yeah, I'm with you. Different translations, long translations, for their style. Ooh, nice. Do you notice? It's not applicable today. Like, it's, it's, it's not relevant. Uh, not relevant to today. So here's our list, real quick. Priorities, uh, no time, don't understand it, it's intimidating, they're tired, they forget to do it, uh, they have the wrong translation, it's not applicable, they just don't believe, uh, they don't think they need a Bible to worship, and no Bible is had in their possession. Good, so you pretty much have covered that first section for me, but I'm gonna break it down a little bit more for you. Uh, I'll just a simple one is, people just don't want to read. They just don't want to. I mean, there, there is, uh, and this is really bad from a research standpoint, so I'm sorry, but there are people who celebrate not reading a book after high school. Like, they get done with their senior year of high school, and they make it the rest of their life with never, ever picking up another book in their life. And they brag about that. And to me, that's crazy because uh, I like to learn, and so reading is one of the ways I like to learn. Um, and we are in 2018, so maybe they're being technical, and maybe they listen to books because you can do that now, but probably not. Right? It's just not a priority for people. They just, don't want, they just do not want to read. And that's for a myriad of reasons. They don't have time. It's too confusing, etc. But I still think it stands that people just don't want to sit down and read. And I will admit that sometimes I fall into this camp, especially when I have like, um, I'm doing schoolwork and I have a bunch of stuff to read or I grade hundreds of kids' papers you know, in a day and you want me to sit down and read anything at the end. I just want to veg out and sit down. But the the danger is when I start to read, like that's it. You know, I will be consumed. And, you know, we've all, maybe some of us have been there. You read a book at 
five in the afternoon and it's three in the morning and you finished it and done nothing else. Uh, too confusing, I think, is a big one. So I, I think that puts off a lot of people from reading it because this is text written thousands of years ago in some cases. And, and we translate it from Greek or Hebrew and they don't write uh, as fluid as maybe we write today. It's very matter of fact in some instances. instances. Another one, it's not relevant to my life today, right? Which is what uh, Carlene said, it's not applicable to my life today. Because again, this was written by a, patri a patriarchal society 2,000 years ago in the Middle East, right? And we, we're a white society in America, you know, that is not very patriarchal sometimes, right? It's, it's changing at least. So it's sometimes very difficult to connect the dots, which is probably why a lot of preachers have jobs. And Christian people uh, write amazing books that can like connect the dots to their time. They just say the same thing, but relevant to their time period, right? So um, another one, so speaking of preachers, is someone else will do it for me. <laughs> Somebody else will read the Bible for me and give me the Cliff Notes version, right? Like I... Uh, I can come on Sunday for a half an hour or maybe even an hour and a half and listen to, to my Sunday school teacher break it down for an hour and then I can get a half hour dose of Jeremy and I've read my Bible for the week. But you really haven't read anything. So we just put the burden on somebody else to tell me what the Bible says. Another one is we just get fed little chunks and we call it good. And so we see this... You, Again, walk around like Hobby Lobby, uh, you see like the Bible verse, and you're like, oh, that, feel, that makes me feel good for today, you know? And so I'm good for today. I read the Bible, I feel good. <laughs> I read the one verse on the, you know, refurbished plank or whatever they are selling that day for 40% off. Facebook is another one, you know? I mean, I, I can't scroll past my newsfeed without seeing like the whole Bible abridged in different versions, but out of order, right? And everybody has their own little spin on it little cards we give to people, you know, blessed are you graduate because you have, I know the things I have in store for you, now I'll go to college, right? And so we call it good, we get these little chunks. And so it's like, uh, instead of sitting down and having a meal, we snack throughout the day, but it's never like nutritious or fulfilling or, or all of that. That's all the negative stuff of why we don't read the Bible. Why do we want to, or, you know, why should we want to read the Bible? Let's answer that question. Why? Do we want to read the Bible? Yeah. Learn, yeah. Guides us. So to recap, closer to God get to know God more. It blesses us, we learn, and it guides us. What's that? You can win Bible trivia. You, win Bible trivia. you know what? I'm putting that down. I'm going to give you a real practical one. Sometimes for me, I mean, to be quite honest, is I have to know the Bible. <laughs> and I don't say that because, like, I enjoy the Bible. But, like, it's, it, it's difficult to... Um, uh, to not know what you're talking about, I guess. You know, like, I, I feel like sometimes I read the Bible. I'm not very good at memorizing stuff, okay? That's one of my downfalls as a person, if that's even a downfall. But, um, like, people will challenge you, you know? I feel like I have to be ready, especially if I call myself pastor. It's not fair, I don't think, because I can sit down and parse out the Bible in, in the context. But, um, but I just have to know it, you know? I have to know it is. It's pastor, and that's okay. That's an okay thing. So please don't take away that I don't like. <laughs> I'm not caring about the Bible. I got to read that much, but um, it puts. Uh, I'm on edge in some instances, but that's the negative. So we're gonna go positive. God is revealed to us more and more every time we read the Bible, right? God is revealed to us. It helps us to depend, or helps us to deepen our understanding of God. So some of us know who God is. A lot of people in this world know who God is, and atheists know who God is, or who we proclaim God to be right? But they just take those snippets, <laughs> right? Some of them. Uh, some non-believers take snippets in. Let me tell you this. It's exciting. The Bible, 
once you kind of learn to read it or understand it is is exciting when when harry potter came out <laughs> every year harry potter came out i reread the whole series so that means there's seven books i at least read the first book seven times but in reality i probably read it 10 to 11 times and, and even carlene just reread the whole series right and that was good because we got to watch the movies afterwards which again i'm not a reader so i got to watch movies and it was awesome but we read those books like that or like whatever your favorite series is or you know goosebumps as a kid for me but it was exciting you know it was exciting to sit down and read the characters and learn about the characters and see what's going to happen next even if i had read the first book seven times already the eighth time through it was just as exciting to me to read harry potter i was emotionally invested now if you haven't read the books or you haven't seen the movies i'm telling you right now it's too bad because i'm going to give you some spoilers right some people were killed in harry potter the house elf was killed I was emotionally invested in Dobby the house elf, and I felt sad when he was killed. When Sirius Black was killed, I was sad. When Dumbledore was killed, I was extremely sad, right? I was emotionally invested in this fictional universe. And that's how you can be in the Bible if you let it, if you try to understand it and you try to get into it and you read beyond the text sometimes or look at the history of what's happening you can be just as excited as what is happening in there. I mean, if you, for example, if you are any sort of um, uh, a feminist, and not, okay, I hesitate to say that word because we all have these connotations, but if you believe that women have a voice and are powerful in our society, then the Bible should excite you because there are some very strong and prominent and important women in the story of God. All right? There is exciting stuff inside of here. If you feel like your life is going crazy and you have no anchor to hold on to and you don't know who God is, but you learn who God is, the Bible is an exciting thing to read. So you read it because we get to know who God is. It's exciting, or it should be. And we get, to reveal, we get God revealed to us more and more and more. And so that's why the Bible is important. The Bible is important because of that. When we read the Bible together, uh, we're going to shift gears a little bit. We should do so. There should be a community element to it. Originally, how Scripture was heard, because a lot of people couldn't read Scripture, they couldn't read anything, really, let alone some Scripture that was written by some theologians of the time, is especially, let's say, the New Testament, the epistles, all the letters like Paul wrote, um, for example, would get delivered to a church. And somebody would get this letter, and they would stand up and read it for the whole congregation to hear. So old church, I could just stand up here now and read the whole book of Romans to you. And you all would probably fall asleep, but that's a different challenge we have for today, right? But it was done so in community. You heard it in community, you listened to it in community, and hopefully you lived it in community. We see that in the Old Testament, right? Moses came down from the mountain with the Ten Commandments and read the Ten Commandments to everybody. That was scripture straight from the mouth of God, right? Read in community that shapes the way that people live even to this day. In community. It was passed down through stories. So before people could even write, that's not fair because people could write. Before these books were written down like they are today or before they were compiled the way that they are today, you heard a lot of stuff, a lot of scripture and a lot of the stories that, Bible, uh, that Jesus told or God told through his people through oral tradition. It was spoken, it was passed down from person to person until somebody said, let me write this down. And they wrote it down. I mean, all the stories, I'm sure there wasn't probably somebody walking around with Jesus, right? Paul wasn't, or not Paul, but John wasn't walking around with a little diary, writing down everything that Jesus was saying, right? It was passed down through oral tradition, which can only really be done in community. I practice my sermon sometimes at night by myself walking around my living room, but that doesn't really mean anything to you guys because I'm just talking to my hermit crabs, you know? So now, community and hearing scripture in community and breaking down scripture in community is important because that's what the church does. We never do this alone. Bible studies are important. So if you are a part of a Bible study, keep doing so. Because sometimes having somebody very smart write a curriculum for you that breaks down everything that's happened can give you a deeper understanding of what is happening in the Bible. 
And again, it's another way to force us to come together in community. Mary could lead the Ephesians Bible study, but if nobody came to her classroom on a Sunday morning, it would just be Mary talking to the backyard, right? But it's only valuable because people come together, they listen, they submit themselves to learning, and they talk together. So Bible studies are important. Do Bible studies or Sunday school. And I want to challenge us to try and make it a normal part of our conversation. The Bible's weird. People talk about the Bible weird sometimes. Like, it's a very important book. Okay. But we don't talk about it ever like it is an important book, right? We have our Bibles that are personal to us. This is my Bible. I'm going to go read this at 5 o'clock in the morning in my favorite comfy chair under light, and I'm going to be shaped by God, and it's going to be great. But you never talk about it. But that same person can go to their friend and talk casually about football or, or a movie they just saw or the music that they hear. They can talk about what they saw on Facebook. You know, we just have these normal parts of our conversation. Excuse me, but the Bible never creeps into it. You know, like we went around the room for MDAC and or the conference I went to, and they said, what are you reading right now? You know, like, what books are you reading right now? And I'm sure all of them were reading the Bible because they're all prospective pastors. But, you know, it was all like these different books that people were excited to read. But nobody just said, I'm just reading the book of Acts for fun. <laughs> you know, like, here's what I learned in Acts today. You know, we have to make it, for some reason, we have to make it like a study. We have to make sure that we're very meticulous about every little thing and every little fact. And we have to make sure that every time I read the scripture, God's going to speak to me. Sometimes you just need to read scripture because it's interesting, <laughs> you know? And we could just make it a casual part of our conversation. Like, it's pretty common to hear, Jacob is really good at this. Jacob will just be like, hey, I was reading this the other day. What do you think about it? I was reading this in the Bible, and it made me think about this. And it's just like, it just overflows. It's like a normal part of his life. And so uh, what that does, though, is it allows us to process through this together. Because none of us in this room... And none of us at our church are the smartest people in the world. And none of us in this world can fully understand the entire depth and complexity of God. But we can start to get a piece of that and a picture of it when we start to talk about it and live life together as a community. And the reason that happens is because all of our individual experiences make the way that we view the Bible very, very different. We could all read the same passage let me give you an example. We can read the book of Exodus together. I could read this to a, a stadium full of people, but the way that we interpret the book of Exodus is very, very, very different. Right? The book of Exodus was removed from slave Bibles because they didn't want the slaves to read the book of Exodus and understand and interpret that a different way. Right? So the way that we view the Bible and we understand the Bible and we read the Bible shapes the way that we interpret the Bible and the way that we can live together in the community as a result of reading the Bible. Men versus women, white and black, educated and undereducated even. People who have no more than a high school education versus somebody who's a doctor in theology read the Bible very, very differently. And so through this collective experience, we have uh, a more unique understanding of who God is. And that's a good thing. That's never a bad thing. But all in all, the Bible, this is God's story. This is God's story with his creation. And I would even say that the Bible is part of God's story. Because the Bible, the story didn't end when the last word was penned in the Bible. Right? The Bible, the story of God, let me say this, the story of God continues today in the work that we do in our community. And so if we only stopped at the Bible, we would think that our work is done <laughs> because everything has been written in here. And the Bible is a very, 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 very important book, but it's only important because of who Jesus Christ is. It's only important and powerful because we believe Jesus Christ is important and powerful, because we believe God is important and powerful. We can only be transformed by the Bible as much as we allow ourselves to be transformed by the Bible. Oh man, I gotta try to remember this. 
We can only be transformed by the Bible as much as we allow ourselves to be transformed by the Bible. So here's my challenge to you. If you don't read the Bible or you've never read the Bible, start. And I say read here, but again, I say this is 2018, listen to the Bible. <laughs> I'm sure, I haven't looked on YouTube, I should have done this, but I'm sure you could just Google audio Bible. If you download the Bible app from version, they will read the Bible to you, which if you're driving around and you have a lot of hours to drive, you can just listen to it, you know, and listen to the Bible or read it and understand it. Because I understand, well, here, here's the fact of the matter. A lot of people can't read up to the level that the Bible requires you to read at. And that's okay. We shouldn't limit the power, the transforming power of God through the words that we read to only people who are literate, right? That would be unfair and not wise. So listen to the Bible. And if you haven't, and you need a spot to start, read the Gospels. I would say read Luke. I think I'm going to say read Luke. Now, if you read the Bible semi-regularly or somewhat regularly, and it seems like a chore sometimes, or it's not a chore, switch it up. You know, like I'm sure I was talking to somebody who's been reading the Bible uh, about twice as long as I've been alive, right? I mean, quite honestly, they've been reading the Bible a long time. And they read it the same way that they started reading it that long ago. It's the same thing. Every, and I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a man of routine. I like routine um, most of the time. But sometimes it's good to mix it up because it makes you appreciate your routine more or you learn something new because you're pushed outside of your comfort zone. So here are some ideas. Read longer sections. Some people read five verses at a time and call it good. Read a whole chapter. Read a whole book of the Bible and just take it in and see what you can learn from reading the overarching story. When we did, uh, a few years ago we did, um, what was that, the, the story, right? Was that the name of the book that was the 10,000 foot view of God? And how beneficial that was for some people because they finally saw the picture of God's story throughout all of history in one narrative, right? You can do that, read the book of Acts and you can see what the early church looked like. There's a lot of good stuff in, stuff in there that we can pull out one-offs and, and be excited, but the whole book of Acts is such an amazing story of the early church. So read longer sections. How about this? Try a topical study. Say this time as you read through the Bible, you know, your 10th time, your second time, your third, whatever time you've read through the Bible, say, I want to learn about how people in the Bible prayed. And just read the Bible for prayer examples. You might be surprised at what you learn from there. Read it in a chronological order. The Bible wasn't written from Genesis to Revelation in that order, right? There is Job, I think, is the earliest book of the Bible. The, the earliest written book of the Bible is Job. So try that. Read from the earliest book to the oldest book and see how the story changes there. It's like reading the, the, the Chronicles of Narnia, right? The first book is The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, right? And they have, I forget how many books after that. But the order that C.S. Lewis wrote those books is not the order of the story as you read it. There's like two different ways to read. Or from some of you newer people, the, the Avengers movies, right? They come out in a certain order, but Carly and I relate to the, the bandwagon, I guess, and we watched them all later. And the way that they came out is not necessarily the way that the story is told. So just try that maybe. Try and change the order you read the Bible. Journal when you read the Bible. This is a really good one if you're listening to the Bible. If you're listening to the Bible, take down a piece of paper and start writing down what comes to your mind or draw pictures. Sketch journaling is a very important thing nowadays. Um, read from different perspectives. Now, this is a good one. If you're in a small group or you want a small group lesson, I'll send it to you. This is what you're going to be doing in your small group. You're going to take the, uh, a story of the Bible and you're going to read it through and you're going to try and answer questions from each person's perspective. And that's going to teach you a couple things, I think. It's going to teach you uh, perspective, first of all, you know, like the, what we identify with in the Bible is not always the person we probably should be identifying with. Um, it's also going to teach you empathy and sympathy for the people that are in the Bible that are the bad guys, but really they might be us. Um, and, and again, this last one, this one's big for me is, uh, I'll reiterate it, is listen. Listen to the Bible and follow along if you want, but just listen to it. When we were deployed, uh, we had little MP3 players of just the Bible, and people would listen to them as they fell asleep. All right? The Bible is important. And I would argue that most people don't come to know who Jesus Christ is because of the words they read in the Bible. 
I'm going to make that bold argument that the Bible uh, will tell us how we are to be saved, and the Bible will tell us what the church should look like after we are saved. But the way that we live our lives and the way that we are transformed by God's story is what's going to introduce people to Christ. Right? And so if we allow ourselves to be transformed by what the church looks like and the people look like in these pages, people will come to know who God is through us. And the more that we can tell the stories that are in here and then live out our own stories, people will come to know who Jesus is. The Bible is so important. And I'll say this again, it's only important because we believe God is important and can transform our lives. So I'm going to end with a word of prayer. And uh, I'll commission us out of here. If you need a Bible, let me end with, if you need a Bible, let me know, and I will get you a Bible. If you want a Bible in a different language, I can find that for you too. Or if you know somebody who could use a Bible because they're beginning their journey, let me know, right? Bibles, uh, we can get them for you. And then when I'm commissioned out of here, uh, if you are uh, so moved, I'll open the table for communion, and we can gather together for the Lord's Supper, um, which again is a celebration of the importance and the power of Jesus Christ when he went to the cross and died for our sins and then rose again. So let's pray and uh, finish up. God, thank you for all of the people who came before us and shared their faith with each other and witnessed to the people around them. Thank you for the people who you inspired and provided education for to write down the stories and the accounts of your people throughout history. Thank you for the ability for us to read it and to listen to it and to hear it and to be shaped by it. I pray that as we go forth into this community, that we lived out the transformed lives that we read about in the Bible, that we are a light to the world around us and we are our life changers as we introduce people to who you are and the powerful transformation that you have given us as believers, you have given me. Thank you, thank you for your the scriptures, thank you for the words. Most importantly, thank you for drawing us closer to you. We love you. I love you. And I ask this all through Jesus Christ, with the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.